Amen. Come on, bro. Preach the word. Today is the uh, third part of our temple series. The first one a couple weeks ago was Revelation of the Temple. Last week on Easter was Celebration of the Temple. And today is Sanctification of the Temple. Now, I know we have some people that haven't been with us before. And so you may not have gotten a uh, temple pamphlet. So uh, we have some more temple pamphlets today. So raise your hand if you don't have one right now. And the ushers will uh, bring it in. And even if you forgot it, it's okay. You can raise your hand and confess your sin that way. Amen. So... Um, <laughs> It was kind of neat, uh, I, I saw coming on in all the way from Phoenix, we have uh, five young ladies from our sister church in Phoenix here, <laughs> Chanel, Ashley, Leanne, Danielle, and Brittany, if they'd go ahead and stand on up, it's great to, great to have them here with us, amen. <laughs> welcome, welcome. Church over there is doing fantastic things in the Lord. Sanctification of the temple. Now, a lot of times folks get another word mixed up with sanctification, and that's justification. Let me, let me talk about the differences as we, we plunge on into this next uh, area. First of all, justification means to, to make just, to make righteous. Our terminology is to be saved. It's a point in time, and we are justified by faith in his blood, Romans 3.25. Amen, guys? Amen. Sanctified, of course, comes from the Latin word sancto, or holy, is to make holy. Sanctification. It's a process. So, we've been studying the last three weeks about a principle of studying and applying God's word. The Old Testament is the physical foreshadowing of the New Testament spiritual realities. In other words... God had physical applications in the Old Testament that now become spiritual applications in the New Testament. And I want us just to take a moment to look at justification. Turn to Genesis chapter 17. God is speaking to Abraham. And he says in verse 10, this is my covenant with you and your descendants after you. The covenant you are to keep. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You undergo circumcision, and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and you. For the generations to come, every male among you who is eight days old must be circumcised, including those born in your household or bought with money from a foreigner, those who are not your offspring. Whether born in your household or brought with your money, they must be circumcised. My covenant in your flesh is to be an everlasting covenant. Any uncircumcised male who has not been circumcised in the flesh will be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. Wow. God is pretty hard line right here. We understand that circumcision amongst the Hebrews was the removing of the male foreskin of the male sex organ. And so... Bottom line, that was the sign of the covenant that was done at eight days old. Now, that's the physical Old Testament teaching of the covenant. Now, what is the spiritual reality in the New Testament? Turn to Colossians chapter 2. He's very clear right there that if you're not circumcised, you are not a part of God's people. In Colossians 2, in verse 9, we read this. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And you've been given fullness in Christ, who is the head over every power and authority. In him, you also were circumcised in the putting off of the sinful nature, not with the circumcision done by the hands of men, but with the circumcision done by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him through your faith in the power of God who raised him from the dead. Now right here we find that the Bible teaches quite clearly that the covenant of the Old Testament was circumcision. Likewise, in the New Testament, the covenant with God is made at baptism. And he says, it's not done by human hands, but by Christ. 
It is the removal of the old sinful life of which, of course, you share in the waters of baptism. We know from Romans chapter 6 that baptism is the actual sharing in the death and the burial and the resurrection of Christ. It's not simply a sign. It is the actual point of justification. Why? Because when Christ died is when he shed his blood. And it's when we share in his death that we come in contact with the blood and we are forgiven and we are justified by faith. Amen, guys? Now, let's look how this all comes together in Hebrews chapter 8. This is, this is a neat prophecy right here in Hebrews 8, beginning in verse 8. See if you can understand it. It's actually from Jeremiah. It's a quote from Jeremiah. The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their forefathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they did not remain faithful to my covenant, and I turned away from them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds, and I will write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. No longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man say to his brother, Know the Lord, because they will all know me from least of them to the greatest. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. Does that fire you on up right here? See, we understand the Old Testament covenant of circumcision was done with a little baby, eight days old. And so being raised in a Jewish household, all through those years of childhood and adolescence, they're taught, know the Lord. Know the Lord because they were learning as they went. Do you see what I'm saying? Under the new covenant, look what it says right here. He says, no longer will you teach God's people, know the Lord, know the Lord, because they will all know me. Why? Because when you are circumcised in the New Testament, when you are baptized, you're baptized by faith. And at that moment of faith, you already know him. Does that fire you on up right there? So no longer do you have to say, no, Lord, no, Lord, no, Lord, because the moment you're baptized, that's when your sins are forgiven and you have a personal relationship with God and you know the Lord. And so God's church, his people, is made up of all those people who know the Lord. You know, last week, it was an incredible baptism with Roland. And uh, I, I was, I mean, it was, it was amazing. Uh, they got on up here and he just, just gave his heart. You know, of course, he's a former Marine and former USC grad, but we're not going to hold that against him right there. But he says, you know, in, in, in the Marines, we have a saying, Semper Fi. He says, it means faithful to the end. That's my commitment to Christ. See, that's the kind of commitment you make at baptism. It's not just a sign. It's the actual participation in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And you confess at that moment, Jesus is Lord. And you are to hold that confession for the rest of your life. Are you with me here, church? You see, last Sunday, Roland was justified. Now, all the rest of his life, he's going to have to work on being sanctified. It's a process of becoming holy. Now, we've been using our temple motif, and hopefully these handouts have been helpful to you. And I'd like for you at this time to turn open to the part of the, of the handout that has the historical timeline. And you see the four pictures right up here. It starts off with the tabernacle. The tabernacle, of course, was a tent of meeting that, of course, the Israelites had as they wandered through the desert. The next one over is Solomon's temple. Notice then, there's a little space, and then you see the orange area when Zerubbabel's temple was built. Now, what we're going to pay attention to, and I'm going to go through quickly so you have some historical background, can understand the scriptures, is you look at the little turquoise box right below the blue part right there. It says 641 to 609 BC, King Josiah. He was a pivotal king in the history of Israel. Well, what was so pivotal about him? Well, we're going to see that Judah, by this time, has become very, very corrupt. And the worship of God, Jehovah God, in his temple was non-existent. And we find 
that he comes to power as a young man, eight years old. And then he sets about, when he's 12, he sets about the purification of the temple. Or we would say the sanctification of the temple. Second Chronicles chapter 34 verse 8. Now the story of King Josiah takes place in two different places. First of all in 2 Kings 22 and 23. And 2 Chronicles 34 and 35. And bottom line, it's the story of the sanctification and the restoration of the temple of God. Now, he starts his reign in 641 B.C. as a kid. He dies tragically in a war with Pharaoh Necho in 609 B.C. Now, here's, here's an incredible thing. Turn over to 2 Kings chapter 23. I'm always fascinated by the relationships in the Bible, aren't you? The Bible says that in verse 30 of chapter 23, And the people of the land took Jehoahaz, the son of Josiah, and anointed him and made him king in the place of his father. Jehoahaz was 23 years old when he became king. And he reigned in Jerusalem three months. His mother's name was Hamutal, daughter of Jeremiah. She was from Libna. Whoa! This son of Josiah was the grandson of the prophet Jeremiah, who was still living at this time. Is that intense? Now, he only reigns for three months because Pharaoh Necho takes him away into slavery. Then his brother... Jehoiakim comes to power. And he reigns for 11 years. Now, Jehoiakim is not the grandson of Jeremiah. He has a different mom. Jehoiakim is known well not only in the Chronicles of the King and the book of Chronicles, but also in the book of Daniel, chapter 1, verse 1, where it says, In the third year of Jehoiakim's reign, Nebuchadnezzar came against Jerusalem. Now, that's a very important date, 606 B.C. That's when the first remnant was taken back to Babylon. And in that remnant was Daniel. Is that cool? Yeah. So you got to have that date. The years pass, 11 years. Come on down to about 597. And we find that his son, Jehoiachin, Jehoiachin becomes king. He's only there for three months. He's taken into captivity to Babylon. And then, sadly, the last king of Judah is Zedekiah. He reigns for 11 years. The sad part is, he too is a grandson of Jeremiah. His mom is the same mom, Hamutal. And the last thing he sees with his eyes is the death of his sons by the hand of Nebuchadnezzar. And then his eyes are gorged out. And he's taken to Babylon. And it's at that point, the date now is 586, that the temple is utterly destroyed, Jerusalem is destroyed, and the walls are destroyed. And that's 586. Are you with me right here? So that's why you see this gap in the timeline. Then it picks it on up in 516, because that's when the temple is rebuilt. But the most important date, actually, is 536 B.C. That's when Cyrus is in his first year as the new king of the Medo-Persian Empire. And he then sends the remnant of Jews back to rebuild the temple. Is that awesome or not? Yeah. So that is the story of the last days of the temple of Solomon. But let's see what happened. Even though the temple was in great disrepair, let's get back to 2 Kings 22. And let's learn a little bit here from... Josiah. Come on, bro. We read in 22.3. In the 18th year of his reign, 
King Josiah sent the secretary Shaphan, son of Azaliah, the son of Meshullam, into the temple of the Lord. He said, go up to Hukai the high priest and have him get ready the money that's been brought into the temple of the Lord, which the doorkeepers have collected from the people. Have them entrusted to men appointed to supervise the work on the temple. And have these men pay the workers who repair the temple of the Lord, the carpenters, the builders, and the masons. Also have them purchase the timber and dress stone to repair the temple. But they need not account for the money entrusted to them because they are acting faithfully. Hilkiah the high priest said to Shaphan the secretary, I have found the book of the law in the temple of the Lord. He gave it to Shaphan and read it. Then Shaphan the secretary went to the king and reported to him, Your officials have paid out the money that was in the temple of the Lord, have entrusted it to the workers and supervisors at the temple. Then Shaphan the secretary informed the king, Hilkiah the priest has given me a book. And Shaphan read from it in the presence of the king. When the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his robes. Wow! Israel's worship of Jehovah God is in such great despair that in their repairing of the temple, they find the long lost book of the law. Essentially, book of Deuteronomy. Can you imagine losing the whole book of Deuteronomy? Well, where did you find that? Oh, it was in the temple. <laughs> I mean, that's shocking! That's, that's utterly shocking. But notice when Josiah heard the word of God, he immediately tears his clothes. And so he tells the guys to go see what's going to happen by talking to the prophetess, Holda. And here's Holda's words in verse 15. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Tell the man who sent you to me, this is what the Lord says. I'm going to bring disaster on this place and its people according to everything written in the book the king of Judah has read. Because they have forsaken me and burned incense to other gods and provoked me to anger by all the idols their hands have made, my anger will burn against this place and will not be quenched. Tell the king of Judah, who sent you to inquire of the Lord, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says concerning the words you heard. Because your heart was responsive. And you humbled yourself before the Lord when you heard what I had spoken against this place and its people, that they would become a curse and laid waste. And because you tore your robes and wept in my presence, I have heard you declare the Lord. Therefore, I will gather you to your fathers, and you'll be buried in peace. Your eyes will not see all the disaster I'm going to bring on this place. So they took her answer back to the king. Is that incredible? Yeah. Josiah's heart prevented the destruction of the temple. At least for a few years. What was his heart? When he heard the word of God. His heart was responsive. He was humbled. He tore his robes. And he wept. When we hear the word of God. This needs to be our heart. Are you with me here church? You know. It's amazing what this man then. Begins to do. Look at chapter 23 verse 1. Then the king called together. All the elders of Judah and Jerusalem. He went up to the temple of the Lord with the men of Judah, the people of Jerusalem, the priests and the prophets, all the people from the least to the greatest. He read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant which had been found in the temple of the Lord. The king stood by the pillar and renewed the covenant in the presence of the Lord to follow the Lord and keep his commands, regulations, and decrees with all his heart and all his soul, thus confirming the words of the covenant written in the book. Then all the people pledged themselves to the covenant. This is incredible. King Josiah is humble. He rededicates himself. Then he calls the other leaders to get together and says, you've got to rededicate yourself. And now I am going to personally read the book of the covenant to all the people. And the Bible says he calls them to once more commit to the covenant to love the Lord their God with all their heart, all their soul, and all their strength. And here's the thing. They do it. What's, what's, what's going on right here? Godly leadership. A man who loves God more than the opinions of other people. You say, well, well, how far out there did Israel get? Well, we know they lost the Bible in the temple. <laughs> now, I'm not saying anything about you guys that forgot your pamphlet, okay? <laughs> how far out there did they get? Verse 4. The king ordered Hilkiah the high priest... The priests next in rank, and the doorkeepers to remove from the temple of the Lord all the articles made for Baal and Astra and all the starry hosts. They put in 
worship materials for Baal and Astra in the temple. He burned them outside Jerusalem in the fields of the Kidron Valley and took the ashes to Bethel. He did away with the pagan priests appointed by the kings of Judah to burn incense on the high places of the towns of Judah and on those around Jerusalem, those who burned incense to Baal, to the sun and the moon, to the constellations, and to all the star hosts. I mean, they had pagan priests. These were not ordained priests. These were not Levites. Verse 6. He took the astral pole from the temple of the Lord to the Kindred Valley outside Jerusalem and burned it there. He ground it to powder and scattered the dust over the graves of the common people. Now, an astral pole, an astro was the fertility goddess. It was shaped like the male sex organ. This was put into the temple of God. And so he grinds it to powder, he burns it, and he scatters the dust over the graves of all the people. Verse 7. Get this. He also tore down the quarters of the male shrine prostitutes, which were in the temple of the Lord, and where the women did the weaving of Asherah. Oh my gosh! In the pagan religions, they, they had the women prostitutes, who as an act of worship, you would go and have sex with this woman, therefore drawing close to that particular goddess. But the Hebrews had strayed so far, they didn't have female shrine prostitutes, they had male shrine prostitutes prostitutes. Homosexuality was the way they gained quote, fellowship with the gods. And he said to go, wow, how could they have strained that? How could they have gone that far? In our day, it's not much different. Today, in many denominations, homosexuals are ordained for the quote, clergy. As a sign of being open-minded. Now we understand as disciples that homosexuality is like any other sin. It can be forgiven if one repents. Amen, guys? But homosexuality is being lifted up in our generation by actors and actresses. And more and more young people are going towards it as if it's okay. As a matter of fact, even cool. There's no difference between what was going on in the temple then as what's going on in the temple, God's people, now. We look and we go, I can't believe they lost the book of Deuteronomy. Can you believe that only a few churches in the whole world practice God's plan of discipling? Come on, yep. It is lost. It's as lost as the true Jesus is. Why do churches not have as their primary sign love? That's the primary sign of God's church. Is love one for another. It's because people aren't involved in each other's lives. You know a lot of churches that people sit scattered equal distance from each other. You know what I'm talking about? You can go to churches and you can shake hands. Maybe if you're in a real friendly church they hug. And once you see them on Sunday, there's no relationship for the rest of the week. There's no one in their life. If no one's in your life, how can you be family? Praise, Praise, the mark of God's true church is love. Yeah. And if there's no discipling, if there's no involvement in people's lives, don't tell me. Don't, don't even dare tell me that these people are free from sin. Yeah. And if you're not free from sin, you're not free to love. You know, our job this morning is to understand the Old Testament foreshadowing of the New Testament spiritual realities. Well, they had pagan priests back then. So if we're going to sanctify the temple of God, we're going to have to get God's rightful priests. Amen? Amen. Let's turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. You know, this is a scripture we share with everyone that we want to share in our fellowship of Christ with. It's the first scripture in our light and darkness study. But for a lot of disciples, they, they, they forget that this scripture is addressed to Christians. 
It's Peter writing to his fellow disciples. And he says in verse 9, But you're a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you did not receive mercy, but now you have received mercy. And the church said, Amen. Right here, Peter reminds the Christians who they are. He says, you are a holy nation. Now, under the Old Testament, they were the physical nation of Israel. Under the New Testament, we are spiritual Israel. We're a holy nation. The word holy simply means set apart. We're different than all the other nations. We're set apart. We're sanctus. We're holy. Are you with me right here? But look at this. He says you're also a royal priesthood. Now, under the old covenant, the priests were the mediators between God and the people. Amen? Under the new covenant, here's, this is crazy. Under the new covenant, every single person that's become a Christian, every single person that's been baptized for remission of sins, every single person that's a disciple of Jesus Christ is a priest of God. We are the people, the priests, that mediate between our God and a lost world. That's what Luther called the priesthood of all believers. So, if you're married to a Christian, you're married to a priest. How do you like that? Now, what, what does it say? What does it say that the role of this holy nation, the role of the priesthood, is to do? Well... That you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. That's our purpose. As a priest, that's what we're supposed to do. And if we're not doing that, then we, like the priests of the Old Testament, are drifting further and further and further away from God. See, I really believe this. Yes, evangelism is so that the lost people can be won, but I believe it's so... The saved people can stay saved. When you share your faith with someone, even if they reject it, you still get pumped. You get pumped. Like, oh, you get to talk about Jesus. You get to talk about the church. You get to talk about your changed life. And you're going, yeah, yeah. But you know, if you never share your faith, you're never reminded of those great things. You're never reminded of the darkness that you were in and the marvelous light that you now stand in. Got a question for you. When was the last time you had someone to Bible talk? When was the last time you had a visitor to church? Now granted, you may not have a visitor every week, but when was the last time you did it? And if you don't have a visitor, don't try to tell me you're part of the holy nation of God. You're part of the priests of God. The priests of God are to declare the marvelous glories of God to a dark world. For some of us, it's been a long time. It's been a long time. What do we need to do? We need to sanctify the priesthood. We need to make holy the priesthood. We need to repent. God will forgive us. And it's time to preach the word. Amen, guys? Next week is House Church Sunday. And those are always fun. Amen? We always uh, have a great spread of food. Uh, The facilities are always closer to all of our friends and family. Next week, I want to challenge you. Have a friend there. Have a family member there. And see if you don't enjoy church a heck of a lot more. Amen, guys? Because you are part of your purpose. Amen? Right. Well, get your little pamphlets out. And turn to the part that says Solomon's Temple. Now, we understand that in a way of speaking, they have the temple facing the wrong way right here. The temple would face to the east where the sun rose. But nonetheless, as people would come into the temple, they go through the court of women. Remember we talked about that last week? That's where Jesus cleared the temple area right there. 
They go through the gate of Nicanor, and the first thing they come to is the altar of God. That's where the sheep and the goats and the bulls were sacrificed. Is that a cranking altar or not? Well, we've sanctified the priesthood. Now let's sanctify the altar, but what's the New Testament parallel? Turn to Romans chapter 12. All right, come on, bro. Verse 1. Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your minds. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Right here, Paul says, in view of Christ's sacrifice... You need to offer your bodies as living sacrifices. Amen? This is your spiritual life to worship. Worship is not Sunday morning, 10 to 12, and Wednesday night, 7.30 to 9.30. Worship for the true Christian, the disciple of Jesus, is a seven-day-a-week, 24-hour-a-day worship. It is your life. You are to place your life on the altar, and this is the way you worship God. Except, of course, you're a living sacrifice. The only challenge about living sacrifices is they have a tendency to squirm off the altar. <laughs> it's challenging to be sacrificial. To be sacrificial is to deny self for the sake of God and for the sake of other people. You know, this, uh, th this past week, um, there, were, there were some challenges we had in a certain part of the church. And Lynn and I met with a small group of disciples from about 6 in the morning to 2 at night. 6 in the evening to 2 at night. In the morning, technically. Then we had to drive home. I was tired. I know Elena was really tired. She was out on the way back. But you know, because we had such a great talk, even though I was physically tired, I felt awesome. There is nothing like putting yourself out there as a living sacrifice for God. Yet you know, for a lot of us, it gets to be 9 o'clock, we turn off the phones, we don't want to be bothered. I mean, after all, we're getting older, so we need a good night's sleep. Some believe it helps their beauty rest, but we know that's false. <laughs> I just got a question. Are you a living sacrifice? He says, sadly, what a lot of people do is they conform to the pattern of this world, and they're not transformed by the renewing of their minds. How about it? Are, are you trying to, to, to fit in where you work, where you go to school? Is there a discernible difference between you and them? Is the light of the altar burning bright in your life? Do they know that you're a disciple of Jesus? A lot of people wrestle and say, I just don't know what God's will is in my life. Well, look at the last part of this. It says, when you're a living sacrifice... When you're not conforming to the pattern of this world but being transformed, then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is. Yeah. Then you will know God's will for your life. The reason a lot of people are confused about God's will is that you're not living your life as a living sacrifice. We've got to sanctify the priesthood and we need to sanctify the altar. Amen? Amen? Now look at the next thing in your picture as you're walking towards the temple. You see right here the brass sea. It's got three bowls, north, south, east, and west. In other words, 12 bowls all together as the base. And this brass sea was 15 feet long and contained 10,000 gallons of water. And that's where the priests washed. Now, very interestingly, turn back. To the timeline, right here, says timeline. 
And we understand that the tabernacle is, in some ways, kind of the blueprint for the future temple. And if you look at the tabernacle area, you see the altar there in the front, much more modest. Because remember now, the tabernacle moved with the Israelites. And then you see this laver or, or bronze basin that's, that's much smaller, of course, with the tabernacle where the priest would wash. Let's go read about that if we could, please. Turn to Exodus chapter 30. <clears throat> Verse 17. Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a bronze basin with its bronze stand for washing. Place it between the tent of meeting and the altar. And put water in it. Aaron and his sons are to wash their hands and feet with water from it. Whenever they enter the tent of meeting, they shall wash with water so that they will not die. Woo. Oh, also, when they approach the altar to minister by presenting an offering made to the Lord by fire, they shall wash their hands and feet so that they will not die. This is to be a lasting ordinance for Aaron and the descendants for the generations to come. Wow. I guess you better wash your hands and feet. Amen, guys? Amen. Now, some people think that the New Testament parallel for this is baptism. But that's really not the case. Because, in fact, what we learn from the scriptures is that a priest would go into the temple in the early morning and offer incense. And then also go into the temple in the evening and offer prayers and incense. So this washing really isn't a parallel to baptism at all because you're only baptized, you're only circumcised one time, amen? Now some people, quote, get re-baptized because either they were baptized as a baby and we know that you can't have faith as a baby. Other people go to churches where they teach that baptism is just a, a good thing to do, a sign. But the Bible teaches that you have to be a disciple and then you're baptized for remission of sins. Are you with me in your church? So that's not really the parallel that's going on here. What is the best parallel of daily cleansing? Turn to 1 John chapter 1. Thanks to church, bro. <clears throat> Verse 5. This is the message we've heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there's no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus' his Son purifies us from all sins. Does that fire you on up? Amen. He says once, once you get baptized for remission of sins, once you become a disciple, as long as you're walking in the light, the blood of Christ is like a continual shower of blood that continually cleanses you. Amen. See, I think a lot of us have kind of a weak view of grace. And so we think, uh oh, if we do one little sin, we go, oh, we, we just lost our salvation. I'm, I, we're in trouble. It'd be kind of like the guy walks down the street and he sees a pretty girl and sadly he lusts after her. He goes, oh, my, and then he goes, oh, no. A car better not hit me right now or I'll die. So, oh, Lord, please forgive me. <laughs> he walks a little bit further, sees another pretty girl, looks at her, and, and then car hits him. He goes, a lot of people think he's gone. No, 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 no. As long as you are striving to walk in the light, the blood of Christ continues to cleanse you of your sins. Now, there's a condition, though. There's a condition. Look at verse 8. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word has no place in our lives. Here's the bottom line. You may be a sold out disciple, but you got sin in your life. And the person that says they don't makes out God to be a liar and you're flat a liar. And you're no longer walking in the light. What does it take to perpetually receive the blood of Christ? Confession of sin. Confession of sin. Confession of sin to God. And James 5.16 says, Confession of sin to one another. How about it? Are you walking in the light? When was the last time you confessed your sins? 
Well, it was about a month ago. Way too long, dude. The darkness is in you. You don't confess your sin. It's a building up of darkness. And either it's going to send you back deep into a cave of depression. Or you're going to explode. Because your flesh is going to take over from the spirit. You know, I, I really appreciate so much uh, one of my very best friends in all the world, Tony Unzalan, one of the shepherds of the church. And I respect this man's walk. It's not perfect, but I respect his walk. I respect his family. He is a true disciple of Jesus. Before our early church this morning, he goes, bro, I need to talk to you. And he pulls me on and says, bro, I really messed up this week. And he shared about a situation that got the better of him. And he, he sinned. He says, I haven't sinned like that for a long time, bro. Really. I, I was first super mad, then I was super down. But I wanted to make sure I confessed it. Wow. That's a true disciple. Now you've got to ask yourself. Is the bronze basin of confession sanctified in your life? Are you confessing your sin? If you're not confessing your sin, I guarantee you there is so much darkness in there. It may be sexual lust. It may be evil thoughts. It may be grumbling, complaining. But it is dark. And the only way out is you not secretly changing your life. Is confession to God. And confession to... You know the thing that's interesting about confession? Is when you say it, Boy, that really does sound bad. You know how you can, you can kind of rationalize, that was a bad thing to do, that was really terrible. And then you say it, you go, whoo, doggies. That's part of the power of confession. It's when you get it out there, whoa, now you really see it. I got to challenge you, if you've not confessed your sins in the last couple of days, you get with your discipleship partner, you get with a close brother, you get with a close sister, and you get open, you get transparent, and see if you don't feel the light coming on into your life. Amen, church? See, we got to understand, that's what it takes to be in a church that really loves God and really loves one another. Because if you've got a whole bunch of gunk happening in your heart that you've not confessed... You're, you have no capacity to love other people. You have no capacity to give of yourself. And so to be a loving church, we need to be a church that has the guts to confess our sins daily. Amen? Amen. Next, of course, if you look at the picture, as you enter into the holy place, which is the first room, the second room, of course, is the most holy place, you see on the side of the wall, right there you see five lampstands, of course, that's just one wall, so there'll be ten lampstands. Of course, we understand from the book of Revelation 2 and 3, the lampstands represent the churches, at least in the book of Revelation. Amen. We also see the tables right in front of the lampstands right there. And we understand that in the tabernacle, there was only one table where they put the showbread, the bread for the priests. And of course, that bread was collected every morning, and that's the manna. Amen? And so we understand that the manna is Jesus. He is the bread of life. And that we need manna every morning. Amen? You can't store up just a bunch of manna on Monday and expect it to last to Friday. You remember what I'm talking about? You've got to have manna every day. You've got to be in the Word of God every day. Amen, church? Now, as you're going through the room right here, you see at the far end, you see the altar of incense. The altar of incense. This is where... The priest would offer up a very special incense that the Lord prescribed how to make. Now, what's the New Testament parallel? Turn to Revelation 5. This is really cool. Revelation 5. This is John's view of heaven. And we read in verse 8. And when the Lamb had taken it, that's Jesus, the four living creatures and 24 elders fell down before the Lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Now, biblically speaking, a saint is a Christian. So you found out today that you're not only a priest, but you're also a saint. Amen? Now, let's start living like one. 
And the prayers of the saints, he says, is the incense of heaven. Now in the Old Testament, it says that it was a pleasing aroma to God when they offered the animal sacrifices on the altar. It was a pleasing aroma to God when the priest went in the morning and the evening to put the special incense there on the altar of incense. But in the New Testament, the smell in heaven is the prayers of the saints. How's your part of heaven smelling? See, that's what pleases God. God wants to hear your prayers. He wants to walk with you. He wants to be with you. And your prayers fire him up. Come on, bro. Yeah, you know how it is. You walk into some homes or apartments. The bull, baby. And next time you come, you, 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 you bring some, some glade or something like that. You know what I'm talking about? Now, I'm not talking about the college brothers necessarily right here. But, you know, you go into some well-kept homes, big or small, and there is a scent of freshness. Oh. So that's what your prayers are to God. You fire God up. Is that, is that, does that fire you up? Yeah. That just by praying, you're getting God fired up? Amen. Don't have an absence of prayer be a stench to the nostrils of God. Woo. Let your prayers be an offering, a fragrant offering to our Lord. How about it? Have your quiet times been powerful? Are you getting up early enough to have a cranking quiet time and then getting off to work or school? Or are you just trying to get a little bit of time in there to squeeze it on in? Let me tell you something. That's not a very fragrant offering. Amen. Well, of course, the last thing you do when you go into the Holy of Holies is you see what? The Ark of God. Where the very presence and the spirit of God resides. And of course that's emblematic not only of the ark, but of the tabernacle and the temple as well. And so we want to sanctify the ark, sanctify the tabernacle, sanctify the temple. Turn to Exodus chapter 40. Remember, Moses... Gets the revelation directly from God about all the things that need to be in the tabernacle. He gets them all fixed up. And read about it in chapter 40, verse 33. Then Moses set up the courtyard around the tabernacle and altar and put up the curtain at the entrance of the courtyard. And so Moses finished the work. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses could not enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled upon it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Is that awesome right there? Now watch this. In all the travel of the Israelites, whenever the cloud lifted from above the tabernacle, they would set out. But if the cloud did not lift, they did not set out until the day it lifted. So the cloud of the Lord was over the tabernacle by day and the fire was in the cloud by night in the sight of all of the house of Israel during all their travels. When the tabernacle was first dedicated, it says that there was such a powerful presence of God. It was so dense that not even Moses could enter. The glory of God was that awe-inspiring. It says then all the time that they were traveling in the desert, those 40 years, the Bible says that the Israelites knew that God was with them because during the day they could see the cloud. And if the cloud was sitting on the tabernacle, that meant that day they would stay there. But if that day the cloud would lift from the tabernacle, that means that they needed to press on the direction that the cloud led them. Amen? Amen. See, the, the Israelites understood that they needed to be willing to go anywhere, do anything, and give up everything every day. Because they didn't know if they were staying or they were going. And they always had to be willing to stay or go depending on the will of the Lord. Amen? Even cooler was at night. The Israelites could come out from the camp and see the fire of God inside the cloud in the tabernacle. And they would know God is with them. 
Interestingly enough, in 2 Chronicles 5, 13 to 14, we won't read it. The same dense cloud comes when Solomon dedicates the temple. And so we understand that the Spirit of God was obvious amongst the Israelites, God's people. We understand the Spirit of God guided God's people according to his word. And we understand that the Spirit of God made it obvious the direction that God wanted his people to go. Now, turn to Matthew chapter 28. This may be a scripture some of you have not read much, but... <laughs> Matthew 28, beginning in verse 18. This is after Jesus' resurrection. <clears throat> Jesus came to the eleven faithful apostles and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Jesus says, all authority in the universe has been given to me. Now I'm giving you this charge. Go and make disciples of all nations. And you baptize them, and then you teach them everything I've commanded you, and surely I'll be with you always to the very end of the age. See, God was obvious with his people. A church in which the presence of God is obvious is a church that is making disciples. Who make disciples who make disciples. Notice right here, he didn't just say, go and save people, though we understand God wants all men saved. Amen, guys? But he said, go and make disciples. And the making of the disciples is not by God, but by us. Wow, that's incredible, guys. Yeah, it is. We're to preach the word, but we're to do more than that. We're not to force, but we are to form those that we teach into being followers of Jesus Christ. That's radical in this day and age. That takes a lot of love. That takes a lot of guts. That takes a lot of knowledge of the scriptures. That takes a lot of sensitivity to the very essence of a person. And yet we find that Jesus promises his presence only when we're about the Father's work. You know, I, I had to smile when uh, Roland was up here last Sunday. And... What, what got me, not only was, was Roland's joy, but the joy that I saw with the brothers that worked him, with, with Ken and Nick and Gino. And they were so happy. And you got to understand, in the West, there'd been a little bit of a drought for a few months. And now, with the brothers coming together for God and reaching out together, I could see not only were they growing individually, but they were growing closer to each other. And it's something powerful because, you know, with each person that we teach to be a disciple, there's some basic things that we lay out from the scriptures. Number one, we talk about the fact that you've got to daily follow Christ. It, that's a hard teaching. Number two, we lay out you've got to come to all the services. Yeah. With some, you may have to change your job. Give up your job. With Roland, he had to lay on the line seeing his little daughter on Sundays. That was the only day he could see his daughter. And he says, listen, I'm willing to give her up. Of course, praise God, the mother of the daughter says, no, we can change it to Saturday. Amen. God always blesses you when you make the right decision. But he had to make that decision. No, nobody in the family is more important than our commitment to Jesus Christ and his church. That is your spiritual family. We talk about the money, giving a tithe. There are times that we're attacked by Satan and we don't have much money, but still, we have a pledge. And no matter what your pledge is, God expects you to keep your word. There's persecution. This wicked person, there's a whole bunch of half-truths and lies about this church, about God's new movement. And you get on that internet, it can send people spinning. Unless they understand that the true disciple is going to be persecuted. As a matter of fact, Paul says, all who desire to live a godly life will be persecuted. 
And then we talk about the fact, hey, you've got to have five to seven great relationships in the body. You only have a couple relationships in the body. Satan's going to take you out. And so these brothers, Gino and Ken and Nick, they made Roland into a disciple. Then Roland was baptized as a disciple. God's sins forgiven. Amen. He was justified. And now he's being sanctified. He's being made to be holy. Let's look at one last scripture. This is, this is awesome. I, I, I've never really seen this. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. In keeping with our theme of sanctification of the temple. The key scripture is verse 3. Let me just read it briefly. It says, it is God's will that you should be sanctified. Wow, okay. Wow. Let's start verse 1. Finally, brothers, we instructed you how to live in order to please God as in fact you are living. Now we ask you and urge you in the Lord to do this more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. It is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that you should learn to control his own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like the heathen who do not know God. And that in this matter, no one should wrong his brother or take advantage of him. The Lord will punish men for all such sins, as we have already told you and warned you. For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Therefore, he who rejects this instruction does not inject man, but God who gives you his Holy Spirit. You see, the Holy Spirit and the Word of God is one. Amen, guys? Amen. And the Word of God applied to our lives changes our lives lives. We are sanctified. We're made holy when it does. Now, how do we get the Word of God applied to it? Well, certainly in our quiet times, we read for ourselves. But a lot of times, we need other people to call us to obey the Word and the teachings of Jesus Christ. This is discipling. And the Bible says right here, it's pretty amazing. He says, I want you to know who gave you this authority. It was Jesus Christ. We need to understand that discipling is by the authority of God. And if you're in a church with no discipling, you're in a church that God has not endorsed. That's a pretty strong statement. And you're in a church where I will guarantee you it's a lot of sin. I don't care how people act on Sunday morning. Let me tell you something. If you don't have people in your life, there's a massive load of sin in your life. Are you with me right here? Yeah. You know, the people that have really inspired me are all the folks from San Francisco. I mean, it's really cool how the Wilsons came on down here in February, and they're only here for a couple of months just learning about being discipled, and now, today, we're starting a new region in San Diego. Is that exciting? I mean, we've had a house church there. Now we have a region. Prayerfully, in a year, we'll do a church planting in San Diego. And it was really, it was really awesome. On Friday, we went down with the Williamsons, who are discipling the Wilsons, and we prayed over the whole city. We went to Point Loma, we went to Coronado Island, we went to San Diego State. In each one of those places, we prayed over that place that God would launch out His Spirit and His Word. And I know that the Lord's going to bless them in a great way. Amen? But another couple that's just inspired me from, from San Francisco is Son and Tanya Tron. And uh, they gave a great feast of a barbecue at the beach yesterday for those that enjoyed that. But it's kind of interesting. Son got baptized in 1990 when he came back from Tokyo to San Francisco because his stepfather had died. You know, a lot of us are getting to that age where we have a lot of family members dying. And if you don't have faith to see that God is still sovereign and God is working, it's going to hit your heart. When Son came back, his stepfather had passed, but his brother had be recently become a Christian down here in L.A. and shared the gospel with him. And in three weeks' time, son became a disciple and was baptized. Is that awesome? He goes back to his wife, Tanya, who is in Tokyo. She starts going to the church there, and she gets baptized. Now, at that particular time, Tanya was a... Uh, a model. I mean, she modeled in Tokyo and Seoul and Hong Kong and all the big cities there. She was a pretty high-powered model. And Sun was a scout for models. And they were faithful for about two and a half years, but then they began to love what they did, the industry, more than the Lord and His church. And they slowly faded away to the point of falling away. Years pass. The Lord puts it on their heart in the year 2003 to go back to the church. They're living in San Francisco, and they go back, and they come to church, they go, 
I don't even recognize this. We've come for a few weeks and no one's asked to study with us to get us restored. What happened? And as they investigated, they saw that the church had gone back to a mainline theology. It had become autonomous and a lot of love had gone. In the meantime, they're searching and the best thing to do is they said, well, we'll just go to any church, I guess. And so they started going to a church in their neighborhood called the Neighborhood Church. <laughs> they went there for three years. They were totally dissatisfied. They missed the love of the disciples. They missed confession, the openness, the transparency. They missed having a purpose about their life. They missed the sense of excitement that every day God was going to use them. They just didn't know how God was going to use them. One day, Tanya's at, at school with, I believe, her, her youngest child, and she runs into Marinella Ward. She recognized Marinella, and Marinella recognized her from the old days. And she says, hey, I've got to invite you out to our church. Well, what's this church? It's part of the new movement. And Tanya goes, tell me more. <laughs> they came, they saw us, and said, wow. We know that God is in this place. For the next several months, then, they started to try to get restored. And getting restored is tough. If you've gotten used to a denominational brand of Christianity, you know that when you start trying to live by the Bible, it is tough. But you know, last January 4th, son and Tanya were restored to the Lord. Amen, guys? Not only that, but son got to see his daughter-in-law get baptized in January. That's Maria. His son Chris is studying now. I mean, it's exciting what's happening. But you know, the more that they're doing it, the more they're getting convicted that, wow, we don't really know what we're doing. We want to get discipled so that we can disciple other people and so that we can spread God's word to as many people as possible. Here's the kind of faith they have. As of June 20th, Son and Tanya Tron are moving here to L.A. to further their training in the Lord. Amen, church? You know, Elena and I are going to be taking off this Thursday. We head off to London. Little remnant group there. Right now, the, the, the remnant group last week had 22, but they had three baptisms. They're the 25 disciples now. We're going to be preaching there. Then we go on to Moscow. Moscow is just a newly formed remnant group with, with the base being two former full-time ministry couples that are really awesome people. We'll go from there into India to Chennai, India. We now have seven churches, sold-out movement churches in India. Amen? We'll be with Raja and Debbie there. Then we'll be heading over to Brisbane, Australia. That was devastated in the past years. Right there we have a little remnant group led by uh, Joe Willis. They only have five disciples, but last Sunday they had 39 at church. They really believe in what we're doing. God is moving. And I really pray that as we end this series on the sanctification of the temple, that you look at your life. You look at the priesthood of which you're a part and sanctify it. You look at the altar and sanctify it. You look at the brass sea and sanctify it. You look at the temple, which is your body, and sanctify it for God. Because with a pure people of God, God wants to propel his movement into all nations in this generation. And to God be the glory. Thank you and God bless you.